puff. Holla ballers and a bro fist to you all and a happy Friday and a wonderful week it has been as we cusp on the edge of completing our sky scale and everything end of dragons is complete in guild wars 2 and that brings us to the culmination of the content that we've been looking at a couple of challenge modes to do but nothing much going on there as we have completed hildy tataru and also today if you missed it we had the war between me and okay mage jumping puzzle champion of the universe in final fantasy 14's summer jumping extravaganza i'm not going to spoil who won So check it out. It could be anybody who was the victor, who was victorious there. It really could be anybody. Uh, not that my wonderful live audience didn't do their absolute utmost in order to uh, disrupt, destroy, coerce, torment, bully, fracture what little sanity I had along that journey. They certainly had the bestest time of times. <clears throat> in order to make that happen but that is what it is and that's fine it's water under the bridge it's not a big issue to deal with but the next week on monday we will be starting and continuing our single player ff journey we will be pushing on into the unknown i actually have no idea what we're going to play as we're doing retro with modern era retro modern era back and forth with the remaining six-ish games that we've got out of that single player ff men menagerie uh so it'll either be 12 13 15 i'm literally just going to roll a dice on the day uh, and see what comes out at the end of it that's my entire plan we're going to play them all anyway so which one's next it doesn't super matter to me i just want to save a cool a couple of retro ones for the future that's all i want it to be but not right here right now you're here to celebrate your friday your evening wherever you happen to be listening to this with a little bit of fun in terms of what goes on in the internet behind closed doors in those guilds see what's going on uh, and our good lady Bex has sent us plenty of stories. She just says a lot of the stories that are coming in are WoW related. Would love to get some other ones uh, to mix in there because we love our WoW stories, but we'd also love to hear from our FF14 community, a Guild Wars community, Destiny community, and any other game. Because one thing is true. Universally, when people get behind that keyboard, they have issues sometimes. And if you don't know it, and I actually had to talk with Mathil about this, is everybody has a story to tell. It might not seem that exciting because it happened to you, but trust me, everybody who has played online games has a story to tell. Uh, so, what do we got here? Ooh. Um, let's start with this one. I don't think it's very long, but it involves a GameCube. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've got somebody who is a housing monopolist in FF, and we've got, also got like a ridiculous WoW one. Uh, but this one's grabbed my eye because it mentions the GameCube, exactly what the GameCube uh, can do to someone. Uh, I don't know, but we'll find out. Uh, what drama can you have with the GameCube? Oh, unless you smash someone over the face. Although they didn't have GoldenEye on the GameCube, so I'm not sure what game could have driven someone so mad. Mario Party, maybe? Uh, we need a guild name. Uh, okay. I'm totally lost now. Uh, we need a guild name. Something from the early 2000s and edgy. So I'm going to look at my wonderful live audience for this one uh, to maybe provide something for us on that one. Uh, something 2000s and edgy. So think Vanilla Ice, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, all those kind of wonderful things. Uh, Dark Light, yes. The Lincoln Parks. <laughs> Grimdark. Oh, I like that. Yeah, we'll go with Grimdark. Uh, Kill Switch and Rage, even better. Yeah, Kill Switch and Rage. I like that even more. I like that even more. <laughs> All right, let's have a fun last hour of our usual streaming week. Although I will be trying to stream over the weekend, but we'll see. Good evening, Preacher, the team, and the wonderful, wonderful chat. I've spread to you before uh, with a title called The Wall of Frost. If you have read it, thanks for reading my tale. I hope it was enjoyable. If you haven't, it must have been shit. <laughs> Fair enough. Now I warn you, ladies and gentlemen... I do hail from the grand old US of A. And though I can rarely catch the live show, I do watch all the vids, mostly the VODs, and I've been around the Preach Cinematic Universe for many years. 
As in my first tale, I want to thank you and the team for supplying me and every one of the viewers with some top-tier entertainment over the years. I would also like to mention that the drama story of The Jedi is my most favorite of all time. I re-listen to it all the time. I do not remember that drama story. The Jedi. Hmm. <clears throat> That's, I'm going to have to go back and listen to that myself. Uh, I actually do not remember that one. The first tale I submitted took place many, many years ago in World of Warcraft Cataclysm. But since I know you like to hear drama from other games and MMOs, I decided to pen another story from my vast MMO repertoire. Uh, like so many others, I have many moments to tell of what happened in the length and breadth of MMOs that I have touched over the years. In that spirit, I come to you today with a bit of drama for even further back than World of Warcraft's existence. To one of the original, the OGs, the birthplace of online games, Fantasy Star Online Episodes 1 and 2 for the GameCube. There were MMOs on the GameCube? What the hell? Is this real? Really? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Cries the chat. Oh, yes. Fantasy Star Online is an online RPG developed by Team Sonic. Oh, no. And published by Sega in the year 2000 for the Dreamcast. It was the first online RPG for game consoles. Players adventured up to three others over the interweb superhighway to complete quests, collect items. Okay, so it was like a four-player game. All right. Okay, so it's not like an MMO MMO. Uh, it's uh, like a four-player game. Okay, eventually it was ported over to the GameCube as long as as well as the Dreamcast. Hmm, ahead of its time, probably. I'd be curious to check this game out actually and give it a play. I really would. I, that's. Uh, I'm not sure if we could set something like that up. I wonder if it came. Did it come to PC eventually? Is it still live? If it's lobby based, maybe. Oh, it, Fantasy Star Online was ported to Windows and re-released on the Dreamcast as a version 2 with more content following Sega's exit from the console business in 2001. Interesting. That might be worth a visit. It was released for GameCube on 2003. Huh. It's still alive. Okay. Put that in the diary, maybe. Maybe we'll get a look at that in the next few months. <clears throat> I want to take you back to around 2002-2003 when I first got into online gaming. Back then, I was, of course, a naive teen, barely two years into high school. And during Christmas the year before, I had visited my best friend at his home. His family, being, well, less poor than ours, had gotten him a GameCube as well as the broadband port so he could play online. He also received Fantasy Star Online, which from here on out, I'll just call PSO. Not to be confused with the new age PSO2 or PSO2, the new Genesis. Now, before I get into the drama, I'll give you in a chat a bit of background on PSO because you likely have not played it. <laughs> okay, that's true. The game itself can be played offline or online, solo or with up to four friends of the same console, or up to four friends online through the Sega servers. So for all intents and purposes, it's an MMO. The general gameplay was like this. You made a character from one of the 12 race class combos that was a combination of three races and three classes. That's pretty good. You had human, robots, and elvish types for races. And the classes were hunter, which was primarily melee and really annoyed me. That's fair. <laughs> Ranger, which was actually a hunter. Okay. And force, which was a caster, but with a cool Star Wars name. All right. After character creation and naming, your character was issued one of 10 IDs. These insignia, based on color, Viridia, Greenill, Skyli, Blueful, Purple Num, Pinkle, Red Rear, Oran, Yellow Bows, Whiteil, fucking Team Sonic written all over it. Let's just, why, why do we make, why not call it Blueful instead of Blue? Purple Num instead of Purple denoted which types of item drops you were more likely to see from rare mobs. There were some rare items that only one or two section IDs ever had the opportunity to see drop. Okay. After character creation, you either loaded into a game solo offline or into a multiplayer avatar lobby and created a room to host a game in one of four difficulties. Normal, hard, very hard, or for the chads, ultimate. 
And in one of these episodes, one or two, each episode had four locations. Each location had two to three sub-levels and a big boss at the end. Functionally, it played a lot like Diablo, where you and your friends massacre the multiple levels of the zones, looking to upgrade your weapons, armor, units, equipable bonus, and stuff, so on and so forth. Go back to the main city and start it again in the next area. Okay. The big thing everybody wanted, of course, as every teenager still does to this very day, are the rares. Denoted by the magnificent red box with yellow text that would pop up after killing enemies every now and then. I should also mention that rare items in this game are actually giga rare. Such as the infamous sealed J sword, a gigantic two handed katana, still in its jet black sire and locked with a glowing purple seal. We eventually found out through gaming magazines that this sword had a 1 in 12,604 drop chance from one enemy in one zone in a particular difficulty for only section ID Skyline. <sighs> I mean, that's good mobile game odds, right? <laughs> I that guarantee I would get it first time. Stream of privilege. Oh, they've sent us a picture of this coveted item. <laughs> I'm not sure we're really going to get the uh, benefit of this. Are you ready, guys? Live, uh, live audience. Look, behold. The sealed j -Sard. Oh. Oh, I need it. I need it so much. Oh, look at it. Oh, it's so fucking good. Oh, my God. It's got a bit of purple on it. For our uh, audio listeners, it looks like something from Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> oh, damn. She thick. <laughs> she beautiful. She awesome. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. <clears throat> yes, of course, people farmed for this item. Of course we do. On Sega Live servers to private servers since released that have yet to see this drop. It was so much rarer than some shoulder drop from World of Warcraft. It is also important to note that loot drops are public. So if a rare red box dropped after a boss fight, it was a mad dash to get to it before the other three could click it. Okay, now I'll give you all that info dump. Let's get into the story. My friends and ours, my friends and I spent hours playing together. All four of us in each other's homes, at sleepovers, on the weekends and so on. I became absolutely obsessed with this game. I begged and begged my parents for the power of the GameCube of my own. And after hunting down a copy of the game, begged and begged and pleaded with my parents to order it from across the US. For my first character, I created a human hunter and named him after my favorite planet and favorite mech from tabletop game Mech Warrior, Jupiter. <laughs> it's cool. That's pretty cool. I played as often as I could. School months, but when summer vacation came around, 15 plus hours a day. I was able to go through normal hard and very hard, only stumbling a little bit in Ultimate and realizing I needed to get better gear and more levels to push further into this game. You see, the max level in PSO is 200. Level 1 to 185 required as much experience as 185 to 200. There were not many level 200s around during these times. And as for those rare items, since they were truly rare, I would grind for days and days and see maybe one or two here and there but not the good ones no 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 never the good ones nothing that i had found in the database on the old website psoworld.com nothing i saw many many awesome weapons but i couldn't get them but my luck would change one night while sleeping over at one of my friend's houses, he informed me that he had used some of the cash from his part-time job to buy another player's rare gear from eBay. He obtained the items through online trade and we just gawked at the amount of rares he got. Now, <clears throat> yeah, we're RMT and GameCube MMOs <laughs> is what we're doing. <laughs> we're RMT and GameCube MMOs. We are truly gaming at this point. <clears throat> now, of course, there are many, many rare items in PSO. And this was a simple smattering of some of the good ones. 
I was determined that I would have a collection of everything this game had to offer to be a god, to be a hero. I asked, and he said he would give me one item. But I... I wanted them all for my collection. So, we decided to do something. We decided to do something illegal. Now, I need to pause to explain the goofy coding of Fantasy Star Online. You see, in the main city area, there is a plaza that contains a weapon shop, an item shop, an armor shop, the use. Inside this plaza, there is an NPC woman wearing blue that walks a random pattern. If you talk to her, it locks you in place and gives you some chat bubbles regarding the shops. You press A to get through the three bubbles and you're able to move again while she continues her pathing. Now, here's the twist. If you hold your movement stick in a certain direction and mash the A button like a speedrunner, you can eventually make her slowly move towards the shopkeeps. And if, if you get her just close enough, just close enough, you start her dialogue while being locked in place. And at the same time, you open the shopkeep's dialogue box, the armor shop dialogue box, and the weapon shop menu. Now, if you do some clever button presses, you can back out of the conversation with the woman <clears throat> and have freedom of movement while still having the menus from the shops open. Now, this is only step one. It's the first step to a whole range of illicit maneuvers that you can abuse in this game. I've included a link so you in the chat can see this in real time. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Unsurprisingly. Oh, my God. This is recorded on a VHS camera. My stars. Wow. Wow. My fucking stars. We are on a VHS camera. Okay, they're edging the NPC over to the stores. Steady. Steady as she goes. Steady. Oh, this is some abuse. This poor NPC. And now he has the menus open. Okay. And I assume, as this is called item duping, we know what's coming next, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Why is this important? Well, preacher chat, this is how you start, of course, the illicit cheetah nonjutsu item duplication. Through additional button presses and interactions with the bank, you can manipulate the menus to have open the bank and your inventory at the same time. And from here, you could select the item from your inventory that you wish to dupe. You manipulate the menus to where you could drop the item on the ground. Then you simply put the item from your inventory back into the bank. It plays a negative error soundbite when you do it, but still fucking works. <laughs> now, duping does come with one caveat. If you mess up a single button press and you deposit the item at the exact same time that you drop it, and I mean with the single button press, you glitch out the game and force the old blue screen of death. This locks up the GameCube and plays a really loud sound until you restart it. Unfortunately, if you trigger this, anything on the ground is lost and anything in your inventory that was not equipped also gets deleted. Rare weapons, usable items, money... All gone if you screw this up. After working out that particular kink, we decided it was worth the risk. I told my mum I needed to go around to my friend's house and have a sleepover that night. We scheduled it so we could be together. So that night, off we went to perform our heist. I figured out how to dupe perfectly. I practiced it. I spent the next few hours duplicating everything he had and transferring one of everything to my own memory card. Yes, I'm aware. I am guilty as sin. Guilty. But unfortunately, I made things worse. 
I spent many hours online playing Fantasy Star Online. And a lot of the time was in different lobbies. Trading. Fantasy Star Online had a thriving trading market. Many lesser items and more common rares were traded for a currency called Photon Drops, which are not exactly rare and just dropped in the world. Think of it like Chaos Orbs from Path of Exile. Some rarer items could be traded for Photon Spears, another currency that's slightly rarer. Now, for the real high-end stuff, though, the big money items, only rare item for rare item would be the appropriate trade. <clears throat> My goal since starting this game had always been to have everything. Every rare item. A whole complete collection. Because I could dupe, though, I, of course, had many, many copies of very high-end items sitting in, sitting in the bank. I had also duped all my gold. And I had multiple 99 times stacks of photon drops and spheres so I could kind of just buy whatever I needed. So slowly over the weeks and months, I would find someone who had that rare item I didn't have. I would see what they wanted. And of course, I would have it available. No problem. If they wanted an item that I didn't have a duplicate of on hand, I would fake disconnect so I could go and dupe one for them. Then dive back online and make the trade. There were many conversations with players regarding how they didn't really want to trade away this precious rare item. And I would always tell them, it's worth it if you would like this dream item that I have just sitting here going all unused and getting dusty. But I was only going to give it you if we did the proper trade. It was after a particularly long negotiation and trade where a guy lamented taking a rare item that he had stolen from his son's account just so he could get his dream gun. Chad. <laughs> Giga Chad. His son had a lucky drop, right? You know what I mean? Your kids had a lucky drop. It is what it is. This is mine now. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I mean, the dad probably did all the work. Let's be honest. The dad probably did all the work. You know what I mean? It's the way it is. His dad also bought him his copy of the game or whatever. Hell, I paid for your upbringing. upbringing so I deserve this one item. <clears throat> the guy seriously wouldn't show up about how he felt guilty about taking this from his... I don't think the son exists. This guy's just a choosy beggar who's like, my son has like diabetes, turbo cancer. And so can you give it me for free? Yeah, this guy's just playing the game. That's all. Everybody's manipulating somebody at some point. <clears throat> but it did make me realize that I was doing something that was wrong. Immoral. I had no longer... I could no longer call myself a good person. I logged off and went to the computer to access the forums. There were countless posts of people who had paid played hundreds and hundreds of hours trying to farm an item from a rare and hadn't seen it drop. One of the people said he was quitting the game because he had been chasing a gun for now 260 hours. I had 10 copies of that gun in my inventory. <laughs> 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 it made me feel guilty guilty that i was taking these rare items from people and despite actually giving them what they wanted i was just getting them for free during this time i took family vacation to the beach while i was there i came to a conclusion <clears throat> that i might be a scammer and that i was scamming people for their rare items that they had worked hard for how do you know for all you know, they're a duper too. It's just dupers trading dupes. It's possible, man. It's possible. Who knows in the online marketplace? After the week at the beach was up, I came home. I logged into Fantasy Star Online lobbies to do more trading. However, I was going to change. I was going to be a reformed individual. This time, I would do something different. On the live servers, many knew that what duping was and there was a lot of negative press regarding it considering how long people have been farming these rares and now people were getting them for free 
Regardless, though, I still needed to finish my collection. <laughs> That's all well and good, but what about me? I understand where you're coming from, but what about me and my problems, eh? I still haven't finished my collection. I got into a negotiation with somebody who wanted a really high-end wand for an item that I needed. I agreed. I created the lobby. He joined. We showed each other what we had. And then I posed the question. Do you want to trade? Or would you like to make an exchange? <clears throat> By exchange, what I meant was that I would walk over to the shop... Open the dupe menu, went the dupe menu, and make him a copy of the item he wanted, and the item I wanted. I'll put them both down, so we both have one of each item. You were going to dupe in front of another player, who got their items legitimately. This was your big bright idea is that you will go to someone who has a legitimate way of getting their items and offer to dupe the items in front of them. That's your plan. Because that is the stupidest fucking plan I have ever heard of in my entire life. That is so fucking dumb. <clears throat> this way, I said, we would pick up our spoils and be on our way, having gained what we wanted and lost nothing. A win-win. He said yes. I figured I had stumbled onto a new winning strategy that would have me no longer feeling guilt. So I continued this for a very long time. I even still do this today. Once in a blue moon when I log into one of the private servers. Of course, there were many people who were elitist purists. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The people playing it legitimately are the, are the dickheads. They're the ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elitist purists. That's what you are. If you're getting your items the original way, you're an elitist purist. Yeah. <laughs> Ruin the fun for everybody else with your bullshit morality. <laughs> They didn't want to be involved in any duping and only traded use what they found themselves and they would put me on ignore once I posed the question. But I'll be honest with you, more often than not, the other party didn't give a shit and they were more than happy to walk away with two rares in their inventory, including the one they really wanted. And happily, eventually, I was done. I had one of every single thing in the game and I still do to this day. I keep my collection on three separate GameCube memory cards. Holy shit. <laughs> you duped the memory as well. However, I'm sorry to tell you that this story has a sad ending. After doing this for months and months on end, eventually, of course, the trading market began to be flooded with high rarity items. <laughs> items just stopped being rare. When everybody has a sealed J sword, a psycho wand, S rank special weapons, and forbidden items, the parasitic gene flow, which according to the PSO World webpage, cannot currently be obtained through any legitimate in game methods, yet I had seven of them. <laughs> That's really funny. Oops. <laughs> Now, I don't think I was the sole cause of the downfall of the trading and the crash of the economy. I definitely contributed it to it, though. <clears throat> I didn't mean for that to happen. I was just trying to complete my collection. And as I type this to you, Mike, and your audience, I reflect upon past me, the past decisions. And if I could go back, and c would I do this again? Now, as an adult, looking back at how the economy crashed and everything else and the sadness I caused people... Would I do it again? And absolutely, yes, I fucking would. <laughs> Those red boxes were crack, and the complete collection made me feel awesome. But I will say that uh, I would have not made sure not to scam people out of their items. I would have just duped them all from the beginning and made sure people walked away with more. Scamming people is bullshit. Scamming the game, on the other hand, that's okay. And I can tell you that I have never scammed anyone in a video game since this day. 
I can't say anything. I absolutely abused a duping scam in Neocron. I did. I did. I abused a duping bug. But, like, honestly, what's a guy to do? <clears throat> what's a guy to do when one of the rarest items in the game just keeps... the, the it was a, it was one of the rarest items in the game, if not the rarest. And for some reason, when you clicked turning quest, it gave you the item, but didn't complete the quest. And you could just click the uh, turning quest button over and over again. And it just kept giving you the item over and over again. I was caught up in the moment, man. I was caught up in the... What was the saddest thing about it was that I didn't realize, like, that it was actually broken until... And obviously, I didn't want to click off the NPC in case it broke it. When I eventually did, the entire floor around where I was stood was covered in these items because my inventory had filled up and it had just started overflowing onto the floor. And if anybody would have walked past at that point, I would have been absolutely screwed. And what made it worse is it also gave you gold for turning in the quest. You got the item and some gold. I was the richest person in the game, which you could see publicly. Because on the uh, info boards in the cities, you could check who had the most money in the game. And there was my name right at the very top with absolutely capped currency. Yeah, it, the mistakes were made. I bought, I think I went and bought 60 apartments to get my money value down. <laughs> Which are like quarter of a mil each. I went and bought like 60 apartments. It was a game called Neocron. I bought 60. It was an MMO. I just went and bought tons and tons of apartments as fast as possible to get my uh, get my money down. <coughs> money laundering? I, I mean, it was clean by the end of it. <laughs> I thought it was really funny. Uh, but, you know, what it was going to be. Oh, God. All right. For our FF14 fans, this is going to be right up your street. All right. It was the Kran Glove. Yes, the Kran Glove, which was removed from the game for several years. And then they, they finally fixed the quest line. And I was one of the first people to do it. <clears throat> and you also could not... Out of the eight factions in the game, only one faction could actually get the glove. And everybody needed it. So all the other factions couldn't get it. They could from me. <laughs> I sold a lot of those gloves. Uh, we need a free company name. In fact, we didn't use the guild name. I'm not sure why we had to put that in. So, uh, but mm, that doesn't fit for that Final Fantasy 14. A free company name, housing related, FF14. Something along those lines is what we're looking for here. Uh, so suggestions, the housekeepers, the crawlers, the house jumpers, Mare Lamentorum. You know, I, I'm going with that as I discovered what that is today. And naughty, naughty. Naughty, naughty. I didn't really realize what was going on with that, but now I do. <clears throat> now I do. <laughs> Thank you for the people sending me the examples of what they do with that add-on. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> hey, preacher in the chat. I'm writing to you from, of course, Team USA. From the land of enchantment that is New Mexico. Is there any reason for me to go to New Mexico? All I know of New Mexico is Breaking Bad. I have... Uh, no reason to visit New Mexico. So if you have a good one, let me know. It's hot. <laughs> There's zero reason to go there. Meth? I don't know. All I know is from Bacon Bad. The tale I bring to you today, though, is from the land of Eorzea in FF14. Back in the Shadowbringers expansion. I want to tell you of a person we met that we sometimes still speak of in whispers as legend amongst the extreme degenerates that we know. Well, that might be getting too far ahead. I will let your audience decide how we should view this person. Some background. I was off and on WoW player for many years with a few close friends. Raiding, running M+, take a little break, come back again when the new content drops, the huge. Until, like so many others, I got tired of Shadowlands <laughs> and was introduced to Final Fantasy XIV by my wife and her sister. Nice. Having been burned on World of Warcraft, I decided to take a very casual approach to 14 and take my time going through the story. I was not going to join an FC, not rushing to endgame content just to experience the raids, to breathe it in and really enjoy my time there. Through my time in the MSQ, we found an amazing group of friends that were always willing to join for trials or the latest dungeon that I had unlocked. 
and we all enjoyed sharing in each other's reactions to massive story moments. Eventually, we formed an FC. What did we call the FC? Oh, Mare Lamentorum. Okay, yeah, I put it up there. We formed Mare Lamentorum. We continued to play together, and we added more friends that we met in game. Eventually, the idea was had. You know what we should all do? You know what would be perfect for us all? We should make a house in game for the whole FC and our friends to hang out together. Now, since my gaming background of MMOs was in World of Warcraft, I not only had no clue as to do player housing, but I also had no interest as that was probably under the category that I had dubbed of 14, weeb shit. So, listening to everyone get so excited about it, I said, sure, why not? <clears throat> you guys go ahead. Unbeknownst to me, some members of Mare Lamentorum were end game housing players. Connoisseurs of what housing could be, the potential for it to be. Story, combat, dungeons. Those were all priority number two to housing. They had the most lavish apartments. They wanted for nothing. And all they wanted was to then spend the rest of their days on a theorist making amazing Final Fantasy XIV houses. So when the idea was had, like corpses from a grave, they sprung into action. With some help from a, a member of the FC who just seemingly had endless amounts of gill, they would scope out a house plot, outfit every FC member who was willing with the required amount of gill to buy, and then the clicking fiesta would begin at the placard. For context, this was back when you had to get lucky with clicking the housing sign in a random 24-hour window to get a house. What? What is this? You had to randomly click at some point in a 24-hour window? That's how I got the crawler's first house? Before the lottery system. You were involved, weren't you? No, I... I I put my name up for it. It took you 12 hours. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it took mind-boggling dedication to get one. Despite my lack of interest in this player housing system, I found myself a role. I would scout out every district when I got online and when I got, uh, when I got offline to see if any houses were available for the FC members who were online at the time to go all out and begin the clicking fiesta. I didn't have the patience, of course, to sit there clicking for hours like a pleb. <laughs> but I would hang out in the Discord and play other games while they clicked away. Our hero. Our hero. <laughs> Our absolute hero. Well, I'm not going to click, but I'll sit with you while you click. No problem while I do other things. <laughs> I like this guy already. <laughs> This is where we meet the subject of our little tale. The myth, the legend, the true housing degenerate. The gospel sent down from the trolley itself to furnish us with quality benching. Every time I would scout a plot for sale and posted it to the group so they could start the clicking, there was almost always a crowd gathered near the sign who had already begun the clicking fiesta. And in that crowd, almost every single time was the same person clicking and clicking, and clicking. After hours of clicking, people would start to chat with each other at the placards, a little banter to pass the time. And this person, who I would see every single time, would never pass up an opportunity to flex in the chat about how he is the only person in Final Fantasy XIV to complete Housing Savage. Here was a person who would gladly sit alone for eight hours or more, day after day, clicking the sign. He res refused to leave even once. He once apparently got up to use the restroom and lost the house while he was away. He would never, ever, ever allow this to happen again. He would brag about having an empty bottle on hand in case the needs arose to use the bathroom. So he would never again be cheated from a house. I'm not ashamed to tell you that I, my wife, her sister, and our other free company friends dubbed this hero Piss Cup Guy. 
legend, myth, the stories and the scrolls of Piss Cup Guy and his determination to get things done. This person with a large, shiny blue dress wearing Femro character would beg other clickers to leave to know that they stood no chance and that this, this time, he would be the owner of the house because of the number of failed attempts he had been through, he deserved to have this victory. At first, I will admit, I thought he was bullshitting us to get pity so he would have a better chance. But as our own failed attempts at getting a house for RFC racked up, we almost never failed to see him stood alongside us just clicking away. Clicking away. I soon realized this guy was being truly honest. He was indeed the end boss of housing. He wanted a house so badly. Any sympathy I had, though, quickly died. At one point, I decided to engage with Piss Cup Guy, to reach out, to speak to the mind behind the Piss Cup. I asked him, why don't you just join an FC to improve your odds of having a house that you could share with friends? No. Absolutely not friends especially when it comes to final fantasy 14 housing will ruin my vision and i have a vision after weeks of scouting the housing wards something incredible happened there were two houses available in separate wards one in goblet one in mist The most incredible thing was that no one was at the house in mist clicking. Everyone must have assumed that houses in Goblet were the only ones available. I hastily put out the call and rallied the troops. Every single member of Mayor Lenormatorum answered the call, myself included this time as it had been going on for too long. We would camp the mist. We gathered around to forge a barrier to keep others away to think the house was contested. While this happened, myself and one other went to Goblet house plot to see what was going on with the other housing clickers who was there well you know at least one piss cup guy it was the best chance our fc ever had at getting a house and we were not going to squander this moment we watched that crowd at the goblet house like hawks while the rest of mayor lamentorum were over in the mists clicking away our perseverance our tenacity and our shady bully tactics worked mayor lamentorum won a house we got that house in the mist. To add insult to injury, the house in the goblet still hadn't even become available by the time we had built our new FC hangout. I went to take a look and there he stood in the golden light, piss cup guy, clicking away, regaling others of his commitment and their paltry, paltry chance of defeating him and he was prepared to stay until the end of time to get this house. My friends, I never saw Piss Cup a Guy, Piss Cup Guy again after that moment. We moved into our new house and our housing savage members quickly turned it into a beautiful palace to hang out and host parties in game. I must say I didn't appreciate it until I saw how great it was to have our own place to hang out in game that wasn't just a quest hub. I revisited the goblet. The house had been bought, but not by Piss Cup Guy. With the launch of the revamped Endwalker housing system, RFC moved into a mansion. At that time of writing this, I would say about 75% of RFC all has their own personal housing as well, including me. That group dedication stuck with us, and we all helped each other get great real estate in the new lottery system. Sometimes, though, I sit outside our FC mansion, on our porch looking out at the sun going down, thinking about Piss Cup Guy. Did Piss Cup ever get herself a house? Is Piss Cup in that house now? Did Piss Cup give up? We sit together sometimes and reminisce about Piss Cup guy. What he smelled like, what his room was like. The true degenerates of video gaming. The man, the myth, the legend. And I hope you and your audience have a great weekend and that you have a great time at FanFest. Maybe some of my FC will see you there. I will not make it because I'm going undergoing chemotherapy. 
He'll be doing all right, buddy. Let us know. I can't wait to hear of all the stories from Vegas. And if you see any houses for sale, if you see someone stood outside that sign, that sign, why don't you go and ask? Are you piss cup guy? Are you the one? My wife and I love watching drama time. We can't wait to hear more fantastic drama stories. But pour one out for our friends. Remember, piss cup guy and his search for a house. Our poor piss cup guy. I imagine there was a lot of people with pre-lottery who just never got a house. Who clicked away for entire lifetimes. And just never got anything. Mod check piss cup guy. I imagine a lot of people just tried and tried and tried. And didn't quite get there for it. <clears throat> you should look at the pipe video on that. I think I watched it. I just can't remember it. Ten idiots go to Waldor. Okay. That's a lot of people. Well, well still though. Everyone's so picky. I think even in our ward, there's still a... Uh, oh, maybe not in our, in our old Ishgard ward. There was still a ton of houses that were uh, available. Uh, okay. Franz. Rickskian. Sun Tiger. Oh, what a great name. And we will use... Uh, we do need a guild name, but we still have Kill Switch and Rage available. I spent 60-something hours straight clicking during that time. My god. My god. <clears throat> Let's go. All right. Preacher and a collection of uh, citizens of a dozen MMO worlds. My WoW Classic Guild, the Kill Switch and Rage, I am sorry to say, is full on elite. We formed from returning players at the start of Classic Wrath of the Lich King. The GM and raid leader is a 35 year old Hoosier kid. Is that. What's Hoosier kid? Is that Canadian? Is that Hoser? Hoosier. Hoosier. Guilty? Indiana? Uh, what, uh, a country roughneck hick. The best evidence, however, suggests that Hoosier was a term of contempt and opprobrium common in the upland south and used to denote a rustic bumpkin a countryman a roughneck a hick or an awkward uncouth or unskilled fellow from indiana there you go indiana hobo a 35 year old hoosier kid who plays a feral druid named franz apart from the uh, gm's druid our core team has my rogue two pally healers named rixian and sun tiger they're married oh no both your healers are married to each other all right Two warrior tanks, a warlock who is an insurance guru, a mage, and three hunters. We have the ultimate balance. No, you don't. You have a husband-wife healing team. Hot damn, dude. Hot damn. Admittedly, it's a slow. It was a slow start start to get us to raiding. It took us seven raids over three weeks to clear Nax Ten Man. All right. Grobulus was a big problem for us, as some of us didn't have PCs that could also load the slime on the floor. Right. Okay. Oof. <laughs> Oofers. And my ex nurse seemed impossible until we realized that hunters can break people out of the webs. Jesus fucking Christ. <clears throat> The four horsemen also destroyed us until we worked out you don't have to stay in melee on all four in ten man. But, but, eventually, <clears throat> we all were geared to the teeth. Yeah, these are some real rookies. Patchwork ran away when he saw he when he saw a kill switch and rage coming. Raid, Nax in Na Raid nights in Naxxramas became all laughs and giggles, stories about our kids, conversations about insurance, <laughs> and speedy boss kills. You'd fit right in. Would I? I do often talk a lot about insurance on stream. It's true. It's true. We, in fact, have insurance Tuesdays where we just talk about new insurance uh, plans that we can all take out on stream. It's a big day. It's a big, big day. Look forward to insurance Tuesdays. It's going to be awesome. Friends, though, scheduled our first Ulduar raid weeks in advance. He was so keen to make sure that this time we would be organized, we'd be efficient. It was going to be a success. 
we debated which hard modes we would do in our first week. Franz thought that with all the information they had, we should go full hard modes day one. His argument was that we've got to learn it somehow, right? Yeah, we're just going to do firefighter week one. No, no problem. <laughs> no worries. I <laughs> can't clear Nax Ramis in, in one week, but we're definitely going to do firefighter week one. That's no problem. But the rest of us, especially the paladins, thought that maybe we should clear the raid on normal first to get experience and items and then start on the hard modes. Begrudgingly, Franz agreed to our proposal. Although none of us had ever done Ulduar before. All of us had been there many times on retail farming transmog. So we know how that raid works. Jesus fucking Christ. Okay. Yeah, it's the same. It is soloing the raid is just the same as doing it at the, the legitimate time, especially on hard mode. <laughs> Practically identical, actually. <clears throat> Just to be sure, though, Franz had a brilliant idea. We would go and do a rehearsal run on retail on our capped characters of Flame Leviathan. It's like a never-ending stream of fuck-ups, like one after the other. It's like a waterfall of screw-ups. I was given this difficult task of motorbike. Mike, we one-shot it, really. On retail. Okay, <laughs> you one-shot it. All right, awesome. <laughs> we were so excited after our rehearsal run that we couldn't wait for this to release on the classic servers. And then that day finally arrived, my friends. We're going to Alduar. We all got there early and went to our familiar vehicles. Franz started the encounter up and we tore through the trash like a tornado, knocking down towers, smashing giants. The big tanks rolled ever forward while the demolishers blasted dwarves and my motorbike zoomed up, picking off loose ads. It felt like an organized team. We felt like Liquid. We felt like Echo. We were working as one cohesive unit and it felt incredible. Rixdian and Sun Tiger shared a demolisher and said it was just like the family road trips they took in the 90s. With Rixdian driving and Sun Tiger in the passenger seat entertaining the kids. They started playing I Spy while we were clearing trash. Just like what they used to do with their kids on driving trips. I don't like it. The first one started with I Spy something beginning with D. I shouted Dwarves. This was correct. <laughs> and we continued <laughs> all the way up there. While we were talking, we all agreed that Ulduar deserved its reputation as the best raid ever made. Now, of course, we wiped out all the hard mode towers. We headed for that big boss area. Even though I knew it was coming, I gasped when the flame Leviathan busted through those gates and killed us almost immediately. <laughs> I didn't really understand what the fuck just happened. All I knew is as a motorbike, my job was to honk my horn at the boss repeatedly. But there was some problem with throwing the hunters onto the boss and keeping stacks up. In the confusion, people kept getting caught by the boss and wiped out. I admit, yep, I was the first to die. Our second pull went as badly as the first and Franz started getting angry. Why are we failing at this? We practiced this. You all know what to do. Just do your jobs. To be fair, we nearly killed it on our third pull. Unfortunately, though, Sun Tiger fell off her demolisher, and in the confusing of trying to pick her up, most of us died. Sun Tiger is lovely and a very dedicated healer, but outside of that, she's pretty terrible. Apparently, she has what she describes as an overly sensitive mouse. In Nax Ramus, it became routine to summon her past the Construct Wing Slime Gauntlet. She would always fall off the pipe on the way to Gluff. Rixia would also have to go to her computer and drive her character from the graveyard to the raid entrance after every wipe because she always got lost. 
Okay. <clears throat> the problem was, Rixjian is a fiercely protective husband. And Franz made a slip of the tongue. After our third wipe, our glorious raid leader Franz pipes up. It's okay, guys. That was really close. Just ignore Sun Tiger and we'll kill it next time. There was an awkward pause. As Rixjian then keyed up. Just drive your own fucking tank, yeah? We'll drive ours. Franz did not like it when people spoke back to him like this and immediately shot back with, don't talk to me like that. At least I can stay on my fucking tank. Rixjian left the... Are you guys going to fucking kill your guild because of Flame Leviathan 10-man normal? <laughs> Perhaps it's for the best. Honestly, it's probably for the best. <laughs> it's maybe the, this is a good thing. I think this is okay. Rixjian immediately left the raid. Sun Tiger emoted slash shrug and left the raid too. Franz said, go fuck yourself and went offline. <laughs> The rest of us were doing laps around the Flame Leviathan trash area in disappointment. But the lure of Alduar was too strong for Franz. Within 10 minutes, he came back online. He asked Rixjian and Sun Tiger to join a private Discord channel where he apologized profusely for being so rude. The pal Oh, they're still going. The Paladins rejoined the raid and we lined up once again for our fourth pull at Flame Leviathan normal mode. The boss died incredibly easy. We couldn't work out what happened. Why it had been so difficult in the first place. I just piped up saying, maybe we should have done hard mode. And everyone laughed after all the drama we'd been through. Franz outrolled me and the hunters for a sweet trinket with heaps of hit. He did his trademark crow of celebration. And Richard and Kaylin joined in the congratulations and everything was right with the world. Briefly. Franz led us to the next boss. We'd killed this boss so many times on retail, but it died so fast we didn't know any of the mechanics. Fortunately, Franz had studied the strategy guide on Wowhead. He explained, as he explained this, that this boss is easy. <laughs> okay, here's the guide. Boss is easy. Tank him in the corner. The rest of us will spread out. When he puts a bomb on you, make sure you run away. Which boss is this? This isn't Razor Scale. This must be XT. Yeah, this isn't Razor Scale. Uh, it's not called. Is it called Razor Scale? And I can't remember. The Fur Ignis is the Furnace Master. This has to be XT. Why are they skipping the other two? Why would you skip Razor Scale and Ignis? Either way. When he pounds the ground, there'll be lots of damage. He also makes some ads. Off tank, grab them, and the rest of us kill them. Ads before boss. Bomb ads explode, so ranged only kill them. And after a while, his heart will come out. We do lots of damage to the heart, but don't kill it or it will start hard mode. Anyway, everybody just listen to my calls and this will be fine. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> oh, are they going for like a server first? Maybe. Maybe they've got like grand ideas. Our first pull, we wiped almost immediately. The tank got crushed into the floor. The same thing at XT. I tanked XT. XT doesn't hurt. What the fuck? <laughs> XT doesn't hurt. Same things happened at our second pull. Third and fourth attempts, our tank died within 10 seconds. What? XT does not hurt the tank at all. You only need defensives when he's pounding the ground and hitting you. Eventually, the tank decided to put on some more tank gear. What? Your tank died four times before you decided to put on more tank gear. <clears throat> and the paladins figured out what they called a new method. A new method of what? You're a paladin, a holy paladin, Wrath of the Lich King. You have like three buttons. What the fuck? A new method. What, they just rewrote the meta? I'm so confused. And on pull number five, the tank survived until the ads emerged. Try as we might, we just couldn't kill the ads. 
There also had now no healing on the raid. So we would wipe before killing the ads every single time. Um, I, I, okay, Bex is saying read on. Whatever is happening here, I'm trying to figure out what is happening here. Are they not using beacon? No, the tanks are two warriors. I tanked XT on a warrior. Like on day one, Aldua. It was fine. XT does not hurt. I mean, the paladins, it's, it's got to be the paladins, right? It's got to be. The paladins are doing something fucking weird. There were also some big ground effects the strat didn't mention. As he just said, the boss is easy and we don't need to worry about it. So he kept dying to it. <laughs> Your chat may have spotted the problem already. Have we? It wasn't the healers. In retrospect, they were doing a fantastic job. It also wasn't a problem with Franz's interpretation of the Wowhead strat exactly. It was a good strat, except that it didn't take the different types of ads into account. Well, I always killed... I never off-tanked the ads. You just killed them as they walked in. Oh my god, they're stood in a corner. They're stood on the ad spawn. Is that what it is? Are they stood on the ad spawn? Oh my god, is that what's happening? They did say they were pulling XT to a corner, which was confusing. Are they stood exactly where the explosive ads spawn? Oh my god, you fucking toolboxes. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. The tank should have noticed that fucking pull one, right? Like, yeah, there's ads spawning here that are blowing up on me. The problem was the strap for XT and we were fight uh, and we were fighting Ignis. Oh, they're not even fighting XT. Oh my god. They're fighting the wrong boss. He's... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. You absolute moron. <laughs> oh, my God. They're trying to kill the ads that need to be shattered. Oh, oh my brain. My frigging brain. Holy Jesus. I was so confused for so long as to what the hell was going on there. Oh, and we did ask, why are they skipping Ignis and Razor Scale? Why would you do that? It's just free loot. The problem was we were using the strap for XT and we were fighting Ignis. I'd like to say we realized our mistake quickly, laughed it off, and either switched strats or switched bosses. I would also like to tell you that we killed Ignis somehow using the XT strat. But neither of those things would be true. Instead, we wiped over 12 times with our raid leader Franz getting angrier and angrier as every guide he read said this was one of the easy bosses. He was trying to keep a lid on it. He was sure if we could just get to the heart phase of Ignis, everything would be okay. As the guide mentioned that doing damage to the heart dramatically lowers the boss's HP. Jesus Christ, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> He's still trying. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, so bad. In his anger, he would just say, it's okay. We're almost there. Let's try again, guys. Through gritted teeth. It became increasingly obvious that he thought the problem was the healers. So did I, like, at first. But that makes sense with what you're telling us in the next T context. Kind of. The, top, the corner thing would be a problem, too. There just was not enough healing going out to keep the raid alive. But he couldn't say that, or he knew that the, both of our healers would leave immediately. Instead, he would say passive-aggressive things like... Is there any way we can reduce the amount of damage going out onto the group? Or is there any way of increasing the amount of healing during certain phases? Is it maybe a healing rotation problem? Is everybody using mana pots and health stones? Sun Tiger started to feel the pressure. She became increasingly apologetic after... Oh, poor Sun Tiger. Oh my god. 
hasn't got the wherewithal to say, it's not fucking me, dude. Look at the healing meters. I am healing my goddamn ass off here. Right? Hasn't got the moxie, unfortunately. To make her feel better and keep her husband calm, the rest of us started inventing excuses for her as we also thought it was the healers. We started saying things like, it's okay, I think I stood in the fire on that pull. Or, I think this fight is designed for priests, not paladins. <clears throat> They're wiping to the ads exploding, right? The ads are overheating. They're going to... I, I'm, I'm trying to think of how we did Ignis. But he spawns two ads that need to be dragged to the water to cool them off and then they get shattered. So I assume they're just off tanking these ads that are molten and just fucking like blowing up, right? They're just exploding and wrecking the tanks is what's happening. But usually you tank like four. I think we did them in waves of four or something like that. Four ads and then you, you cooled them off and killed them. Even when Ignis put Franz in his slag pot, which clearly was not in the strat that Franz was using, he still didn't realize what was going on. Eventually, we all ran out of hope. The mage declared after a particularly pathetic wipe. Last try for me, guys. Oh, that's dark. You know it's dark when that comment comes out. It's last try for me, which means we're not going to kill it. I'm giving you one last warning before I leave, so I'm not just dipping immediately. And when that pull failed, the raid silently disbanded. Most of us returned to Dalaran to lick our wounds. The tanks and Franz moved to a separate Discord channel to review the strat and watch videos of the fight. <laughs> I saw an ad for another guild in trade chat and was seriously considering just jumping ship there if we couldn't kill more than two bosses on normal mode in an entire raid night. About 25 minutes later, the off tank returned to our channel and said, Guys, <laughs> you're not going to believe this. That boss was not XT. The next day, we went back to Ulduar and one-shot XT. We also killed Razor Scale, the three dwarves, and Collagon with some difficulty. Eventually, we actually beat yogg -Saron. But <laughs> once we worked out, you have to activate the giants in the main hall for the buffs. We did 12 pulls before we realized that. <laughs> Just do Yogg Zero. No worries. Easy game, easy life. Oh my god. But I tell you this preacher, Kill Switch and Rage to this day has never ever pulled Ignis again. It is now a rule in the guild that we never ever ever go back to the boss that nearly killed our entire guild on our first raid night of Alduar. Well, thanks for reading my tale. And you're welcome in Kill Switch and Rage anytime. Nah. <laughs> hard pass, dude. That is a hard pass for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll skip that one. No worries. <laughs> it's okay. Thanks for the invite. <clears throat> Thank you. I, 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 I did it all back in the day, etc., etc., etc. Oh, God. Ladies and gents, that brings us to the end of drama time for this week. And uh, maybe the streams, I'm not sure. Uh, it'll be Sunday, if anything. Um, if I can do something. We'll see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> my family just got back home, so I'm going to go see my boys and have some fun with them. But have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for being with us. Single Player FF begins on Monday. Um, so I'll see you then for the dice roll in the morning. It's going to be an exciting time, all right? Be awesome, everybody. Love you guys. See you again. Bye-bye.